Okay, great. Thank, thank you. Um, first, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight and thank MassTLC <coughs> for um, coordinating this event. So my name is Joe Catella. I'm the founder and CTO of a company in downtown Boston called Cloud Health Technologies. Uh, what we do is we deliver a SaaS product for cloud service management. And uh, we have a fantastic panel here tonight that's representing a number of different aspects of the cloud, including uh, SaaS and uh, uh, platform as a service, as well as infrastructure as a service. But before we jump in, I was going to spend 10 or 15 minutes and talk about my favorite topic, which is cloud computing. And I'll just kind of talk to you about some of the trends that we're seeing across the cloud today. And uh, I won't have any time for questions, so, um, so we'll, we'll jump right into the panel session after this. But if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them um, in the networking event tonight. So. Uh, we'll, we'll jump right in and get started. So uh, by way of background, <clears throat> so I'm a um, technical executive and an entrepreneur. Um, you can find me blogging at High Tech and the Hub, and you can guess what my favorite topic to blog about is, which is, of course, the cloud. Um, I built large-scale cloud computing infrastructure, uh, primarily around infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. So one of the largest deployments I built was around 5,000 cores of compute, about uh, four petabytes of storage. And uh, this was in the 2010, 2011 timeframe. So it was at a time when you were really pioneering in the cloud. Um, so from that, I really developed um, a really uh, deep appreciation for some of the challenges of managing at scale, and so uh, that's founded. Okay. So what I'm going to do is bring you through some of the drivers that are, um, you know, what's driving the cloud today, and then just talk about some of the trends I see. So as an um, entrepreneur and, and just based on the nature of my company, I spent a lot of time talking to uh, both large enterprises as well as fast-growing technology companies, so I'll just kind of introduce you to some of the trends that we see. Okay, so why does the cloud happen? I think this is generally a well understood topic. I mean, I think most people know that they're, they're going to the cloud for cost, they're going to the cloud for agility, they're, they're really trying to get uh, access to global infrastructure, consumption based pricing. I mean, what's, you know, anybody here, does, is there anything else that's really not on this list that people have seen before? Okay, great. You know, I think one of the things that's not always talked about as much is just the innovation. When I started my company, uh, I, my first Amazon bill that I received was $11. And that was uh, month one of my company. By month three, I had my first customers, and I was spending, I think, $22 a month. And by month six, I was run, I think I was generating around $100,000 in annual recurring revenue, and I think I was running that on $65 a month. And then by month 12, we had a full-blown business that was uh, spending $1,000 a month. And today, obviously, I won't tell you our cloud bill. It's actually pretty substantial. but. But we're 80 people, we've grown really quickly, and the ability to have that undifferentiated heavy lifting just taken off of our, our plate and allow us to focus on building the business really was the single greatest innovation of the cloud. Okay, um, in terms of where we're at, this is just something I pay attention to, which is in this, this uh, technology adoption lifecycle, it's really different for SaaS than it is for infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. This is really a view of infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, I think. Uh, SaaS at this point really has achieved kind of uh, peak in the in the seven degree that Jeff. Yeah. Um, from an infrastructure as a service, I view around 2014, 2015. It's really when if you did not have a infrastructure as a service or platform as a service strategy that was at least in the early phase of execution, you were starting to get behind. So we're really entering what's called the early majority. With the pioneers, the companies like Netflix and even our local Acquia. Is people familiar with Acquia? Um, you know, I think one of their public blog, public blog posts they did a few years ago mentioned that they run 8,000 servers in the cloud. I'm sure it's much more than that, but that's that's publicly what they stated about three years ago. Um, uh, Netflix, you know, massive infrastructure right there. They pioneered the cloud at a time when a lot of the early constructs really weren't there, and they had to build build new processes, build new technologies to make this possible. And then you started to see companies like Capital One and Intuit, which were really forward-thinking enterprises that were stepping into the cloud and really looking at um, how they could actually bring greater agility to their organizations to increase their competitive advantage. And now we're at a point now where I think everyone else, I call this the third wave of adopters. The first waves really were pioneers and they, they, were, they were really betting their businesses on the cloud and taking great risks. Um, the second waves uh, really, really was, it, it was companies that we're forward thinking, but it was more of a measured risk. And now we're into the third wave where I think most people view the cloud as a uh, must have today. Um, another trend you see, uh, between if you look at uh, the revenue generated, I think it's, you know, last year there was $54 billion in SaaS revenue that was generated. I think it was somewhere around $28 billion in uh, infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. It's very clear that the public cloud and SaaS are dominating 
uh, the cloud landscape today. You'll see I had this quote from Adam Jacob. I was really surprised. Back in 2011, I attended um, OpenStack Boston, and I think it was the height of the private cloud movement. It, it was at a time when we kind of all thought from an infrastructure platform service perspective that we were going to build these great private clouds, and this is how we're going to actually support our business partners. And really that, um, you know, one of the things I don't think people talk about in 2015 much is that that just fell apart, which is, you know, people look at what's happening in Amazon and what's happening in Microsoft from an infrastructure and a platform perspective, and they realize the pace of innovation. I, mean, I think Amazon delivered 452 updates last year, basically feature enhancements last year to their public cloud. That pace of innovation is just something that you can't really rival with a private cloud. So, uh, SaaS as well, it's just, you know, I think SaaS went from over the last uh, five, six years as something that, that many enterprises were suspicious of to something that initially got adopted in lines of business through shadow IT and now it's just commonplace and expected to be part of your core business. So it's a, it's a big shift in how we think about the product. Okay. Um, second one, enterprise adoption is accelerating. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I always find interesting is initially both uh, SaaS as well as uh, infrastructure as a service was adopted in lines of business. So it was really driven by shadow IT, by lines of business that were working around their centralized IT and really trying to uh, bring innovation and agility into their businesses. And they were doing it without the full support of, uh, of IT. And uh, they brought in great innovation in terms of mobile, in terms of SaaS, in terms of uh, cloud and uh, you know, a variety of different technology. Open source is another great example of that. If you look today, uh, enterprise adoption really has been embraced by IT. What I've seen is starting around 2014, I've started to see a lot of um, changes in terms of how IT approaches uh, the cloud. And that really has um, just put fuel on fire in terms of the adoption of the enterprise. And so you see, if for anyone here go to reInvent this last year, Amazon reInvent? Okay, so a few people, yeah? Okay. So it's, uh, it's Amazon's premier conference. Um, Amazon loves to put on the stage all of their great enterprise customers that are really going big in the cloud. And I think what we're seeing, and I'm seeing this personally just by the people that I talk to, is the enterprise has moved from the cloud being something that's a component of their strategy to particularly the public cloud and SaaS is the centerpiece now of their strategy. Okay. Complexity. This is something I think is an underserved topic people don't talk about much. In, um, uh, today in the cloud computing community, which is if you go, uh, if you kind of follow, it's probably hard to see here, but if you look at the uh, red uh, line that's there, that's the complexity of managing infrastructure. And around the time that we had type one hypervisors, the complexity of managing infrastructure substantially went up from physical infrastructure. And then you see the introduction of the cloud and all of a sudden it starts to spiral out of control. The, the white line is the ability of us to actually manage through people, processes, and technology to manage that complexity. And I call this the complexity gap, which is every um, year, every quarter, every month, every week, I have been in the cloud, which is you know, starting back in 2009, for at least infrastructure and platform services. Uh, it is more complex than the previous year, quarter, month, week. And so I think this is, um, this is kind of one of the dirty little secrets of the cloud. It requires um, a lot of smart, talented people, a lot of smart choices and tools. It's, um, it's a topic not discussed well, and I think it is um, something to pay attention to because it's a future friction that, that will um, be applied to, to cloud adoption at some point in time. And I think we'll probably see it in the third wave of adoption. Okay. And uh, governance. Is anyone here wrestling with the problem of governance in their cloud? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll raise my hand. I mean, I'm, uh, I think uh, anyone in the cloud at scale probably has some form of governance problem. So what this is, is if you think about it, whether you're managing cost, availability, performance, security, usage, whatever it is you're doing in the cloud, you need to actually uh, manage that quite tightly. And what happens in the cloud is the adoption tends to be decentralized. And so uh, the, the ownership model that we had a decade ago has just been disrupted. And now you, you have a shared ownership model that has resulted in changes occurring to your, your SaaS services, your infrastructure services, and your plat platform services from multiple places across an organization. And so this yields a substantial governance problem. So, um, you know, I had one, uh, one of our customers actually had an engineer accidentally launch 25,000 servers over the course of a day. And of course, I had to pay a bill for that. And, uh, you know, it's just an example of with a few lines of code, you can actually uh, make really substantial changes from a, a security, from a, a cost, a usage performance perspective. 
So governance is increasingly uh, a challenge. People are starting to adopt tools and processes. You know, I'm seeing um, one of the trends I've seen, I came back from the Silicon Valley a few weeks ago, and one of the trends I've seen uh, among a lot of the uh, top tech, co tech companies there, like the Pinterest and the Yelps and uh, companies like that, is they're adopting a model that's driven by agility. They're adopting a model where they're really trying to push the management of their infrastructure out to the endpoints and their and their their, um, their SaaS services out to the endpoints of their business, and they're trying to have lightweight uh, centralized governance. And it's kind of this new model that's emerging. And the idea is dial your business towards agility, get the benefit of the cloud, but you can't just have all the benefit of the cloud. There needs to be some some control over that. Okay. Couple more, and we'll get uh, we'll be done. So security. Anyone hear of this code spaces incident from a couple of years ago? I think it's maybe a year and a half ago now. It's just worth noting. Um, security is still a concern. Most people I talk to, uh, both at the enterprise and the fast growing technology level, will tell you they think whether it's a, a SaaS service or if it's a, a, a public cloud provider, they feel as though the security that's provided in the cloud today is actually better than their data centers. And I don't know if um, you've heard that before. It really was the opposite five years ago. But there is great risk in the cloud, and I think uh, we'll talk to that on the panel a little bit. But Codespaces was a New Jersey-based, I think it was development collaboration tools. Uh, they had their entire business, they were a startup, they had their entire business in Amazon. And uh, one day they, um, uh, they, they received an you know, email saying that, um, that, that they, their account had been hijacked and that they wanted some, that some hacker wanted some money. And so uh, they uh, ended up debating what to do. They looked at their Amazon account. They did, in fact, find that somebody had taken over their uh, root of their Amazon account. <laughs> they made the decision that they would actually try to gain back control. And in the process of gaining back control, uh, they didn't realize there were a set of backdoor accounts that were set up. And within a few minutes, everything across their infrastructure was shut down and all their data was deleted. And basically, the business was, I think, shut down a week later. And it's just an example of when you buy into infrastructure as code in the cloud, you can be more secure, but you can also be a hell of a lot less secure. A few lines of code can shut down a business if, uh, if you allow it to. So uh, security is still a concern, but you know, the flip side is, is the expressiveness of security and the controls you can put in place in the cloud are, have never been better. I mean, um, I see customers in the SMB space that can implement security models that, that uh, financial institutions would have been jealous of 10 years ago. And they're able to do it because it's it's easy. They provision it uh, through through code. It's a, a very simple model to actually put a really defense in depth layered security model in place in the cloud. But you have to know to do that. Okay. Uh, cost. Anybody struggling with cost in the cloud, whether it's SaaS or platform as a service? Okay. So costs grow up, grow rapidly. I think on average, um, across uh, most of the customers we see their costs from a cloud perspective, uh, both SaaS and, and uh, infrastructure service goes up somewhere between uh, five to seven percent per month. Um, so that's the pace of adoption that they're seeing and it's also uh, the challenge of them getting control over that. So this is a constant challenge. I think one of the biggest changes is that uh, years ago we used to make capital purchases, we'd get together, we'd talk about it and that would last us for a quarter or a year or whatever the period of time is that um, that we were actually making the purchase for. And now you can actually make these decisions down to seconds, microseconds. And uh, you can have a, a DevOps engineer change the cost of goods of your product in a, a matter of minutes. Um, so it's, it's a continuous process now, which is something that I think many of us are uh, evolving to understand. And then vendor lock-in. Is anyone concerned about vendor lock-in, whether it's a SaaS service? Yeah. This, is, this is, I think, a, I think this will be the topic of the year, which is, uh, I think across most of our SaaS services, we've been willing to accept vendor lock-in. So if we go with Office 365 or we go with Google Apps, we're willing to accept that. I think when it comes to infrastructure, we've been more concerned about trying to be agnostic. And I think the uh, idea of infrastructure as a service, I call what uh, Amazon did, I call it the functional spec for infrastructure as a service, which is, you know, if you, you look, it's you have basically different types of compute that's available, you have different types of storage, they have uh, different performance considerations. You kind of put it all together and there's just there's basically a tight functional spec that pretty much everyone who's built a public cloud has followed that functional spec. Um, platform as a service is the wild west. You look at uh, services like Kinesis and um, you, you, you look at some of the um, uh, you know, blob storage from Microsoft and, and th these start to really be highly differentiated and when you buy into these services it definitely brings you down a path where 
you're not likely to switch to another another service. So uh, this is something that I think will be uh, for the next couple of years. We'll be wrestling with exactly how do you manage this. Okay. And uh, the hybrid future. So uh, this is a hot topic among our customers, which is they're starting to struggle with the fact that. They have physical data centers, they have infrastructure in physical data centers, there's, there's infrastructure there that's not going to move. They have SaaS services that are replacing some of that physical infrastructure. They have public clouds, they have private clouds. It's, um, you know, this is the next decade of us trying to wrestle with how do we get efficiency out of this, where do we put different workloads, how do we best optimize um, our, our, our use of our applications. Uh, so I think, you know, this is a, um, I think this will be a constant challenge. You're starting to see vendors and technologies and tools uh, evolve to help support the hybrid cloud future. But it's definitely, it's going to be a messy future as we start to navigate this. But the upside is of the cloud is just uh, substantial. I mean, you know, my own, my own case study of just being able to build a business on, uh, you know, basically a profitable business on less than $30 a month in uh, Amazon spend is, uh, the ability to do that was not there up until uh, the cloud, so. So that's it, I think. Uh, I could probably take a question or two and we can jump to the panel. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay, great. Uh, anyone? Yeah. So you said agility, and it sounds like, you know, coming off of your trip to Silicon Valley, that's the term that's getting what you knew overloaded. Is that more what? Well, like, how does that translate out of the management speech and into? Into what it actually means to them? Yeah, sure, I can do that. So, uh, so the question is, is uh, agility is an overloaded term, and uh, what exactly are, are people meaning when they say agility in the cloud? And, and you're right, it is an overloaded term. I think what you'll see is um, sometimes businesses are really trying to dial for cost, right? It's about cost efficiency. We went through a whole decade of trying to optimize um, cost. I think what we're seeing now is we're seeing businesses realizing that all this outsourcing we did, all this you know, trying to drive down cost of our infrastructure, Really, that, that was not the real business problem. You know, the real business problem was innovation and being able to move fast and being able to um, uh, basically innovate for our customers. And so I think when I say agility, and I think in the context that it was used in the conversations I was having, it really was about innovating for your customers, whether you're a Capital One, Intuit, or Netflix. It's about finding ways to delight your customers with new features or new ways to bring to market what it is that you do. And so I think that's just a different way of looking at it, which is, it's not about just cost efficiency. You know, cost has a, a greater dimension of you know how successful is your business. And one more, and then we can dive into the panel. So about a few years ago, the bulk of migrations for large enterprises to the cloud were CRM applications, to Salesforce. Yeah. But in the last couple of years, what would be the typical applications that <coughs> larger enterprises are looking out? I mean, you're you're seeing everything. So you see. Oh yeah. Yeah, thank you. I know. <laughs> you know, if I take the third question, I still wouldn't get it. Um, yeah, so the, the, the question is is that uh, for probably a decade, we've seen primarily it's been um, CRM that's been moving into the cloud. And so what else is moving to the cloud? And if you look, it's, it's Salesforce automation, it's ERP. I mean, you look at just my company as a small and medium business, uh, we have the entire business, it's 80 people, it's um, a set of MacBooks, and no infrastructure. I, you know, I think we have, um, we have a Wi-Fi router in our, in our, in our closet. But uh, everything we do is a SaaS service, whether that's you know, driving our, our marketing automation, driving our sales process, uh, driving uh, engineering agile processes. So I think there's a, there's a SaaS product for everything today. And uh, increasingly, we're starting to see you know, large-scale adoption, less so in the enterprise across that, that breadth of tools, certainly in the SMB. If you're a, um, a cloud center company born today, the odds are you have no infrastructure. Uh, everything is everything is somewhere else, and it's a new model. It's um, you know, it's incredibly freeing uh, when you don't actually have to worry about managing infrastructure. You have to worry about your Wi-Fi router going down. But aside from that, it's uh, everything else is remote. Okay, great. Um, I appreciate it. If you have more questions, uh, I'll be around for the networking event, and I'm happy to do that. So let's <laughs> our panel.